Thank you all for coming to this exciting event, which is part of the Africa Speaker Series that we are currently running at Watson. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Alex DeWall to campus, who is the Executive Director of the World Peace Foundation and a researcher professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He's considered one of the foremost experts on Sudan and the Horn of Africa, and his scholarship and practice has also probed humanitarian crisis and response, human rights, HIV and AIDS, and governance in Africa, as well as conflict and peace building. He is the author of numerous books, including the most recent, Mass Starvation, The History and the Future of Famine, um, The Real Politics of the Horn of Africa, Money War, and the Business of Power, AIDS and Power, Where There Is No Political Crisis Yet, a History of Darfur, and uh, History of Famine Crimes, which my students will know very well because they're reading it right now. Um, Professor DeWall received his DPhil from Oxford for his thesis on the 1984-1985 Darfur Famine in Sudan. He's worked for several Africa-focused human rights organizations focusing on the Horn of Africa and especially on avenues um, to peaceful resolution and the Second Sudanese Civil Con uh, War. He's researched at the intersection of medicine and public health, specifically HIV and AIDS. And he has held numerous fellowships and important positions at different institutes. So it is my pleasure to welcome Professor DeWall, who will be speaking to us today about starvation crimes in the Horn of Africa. Thank you very much. It's a, it, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, one of the oddities of being a, uh, the executive director of the World Peace Foundation is that when the foundation was established in 1910, our founder, the publisher Edwin Ginn, um, gave the endowment, but with the provision that when uh, world peace has been achieved, which he hoped would be soon, the, the proceeds for the endowment would not go to us, but would go to the uh, Charles Bank Home for the Working Women of Boston. And every November, the, the board of the foundation meets to decide whether world peace has been achieved. And after 109 years, I'm afraid the, the vote has always gone in one direction. But, and, 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 I, and, I, and, and I think my job is actually going to be secure for at least another year at the moment. Um, but November 14th, you will know whether world peace has formally been, uh, been achieved. But what I want to talk about today is, is, is really three things. I want to introduce the concept of starvation crimes, I think a, a concept that has intuitive resonance. Um, I want to give a quick overview of three episodes of starvation, famine, humanitarian crisis in the Horn of Africa, recent and developing, and then turn lastly to some current responses to uh, this cluster of, 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 of problems uh, and, 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 and point to where they're going right and where they, uh, they are not. And you people at the back, there are a couple of seats over here at the front. Um, so last year I, I, I published a book called Mass Starvation, The History and Future of, of, of Famine. And the, this book tried to do a number of things, and one of them was to bring together the concepts of, of famine and the concepts of mass atrocity and genocide. And these two pictures I put up because they were both pictures that were used in reviews of the book. Okay? And usually if you, if you do a Google search and you look for pictures of, of famine or starvation, you get something like the one on the top left, uh, dry earth, cracked earth, withered crops, etc implying that, that famine and starvation are a natural phenomenon. And, and, and I assume that the, uh, the editor or picture editor of the, the, the Dutch magazine that ran, the, ran a review of my book just automatically did that because, and, and came up with this uh, picture, which in my view is rather misleading. The, the other one on the bottom right is a picture of, of uh, uh, the inmates of a prisoner of war, a Nazi prisoner of war camp, these were uh, Soviet prisoners of war, on their release in, in 1945. And that is the sort of picture that is much more commonly associated with, with imagery of the Holocaust and genocide. And as it were, uh, 
these two concepts, famine and genocide, seem to occupy different places in our brain. Um, they don't, you know, if you do your own Google, your own mental Google image search of famine and genocide, you will very rarely come up with, with an overlapping or similar set of, 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 of images. And what I wanted to try and do in the book was to argue actually they belong together. Actually, most of the episodes of famine in history have been episodes in which the starvation was deliberately engineered for political or military purposes. And that uh, famines, therefore, belong within the broader category of, 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 of mass atrocities, of acts of, of suffering inflicted on uh, large populations by uh, military and political leaders either out of deliberate intent to harm and destroy or out of recklessness or, or in, an indifference or a mixture of, 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 of those. Um, this is, um, so that was, that's really the agenda. And, and what's, what I found very interesting is that a couple of years ago when I was researching the book, this seemed to be uh, a, a remote prospect, but rapid progress is being made. And it's rather, it's rather um, encouraging from my point of view to see the extent to which things have moved on. And I will come back to that at the end. So starvation is prohibited in various ways uh, under international humanitarian law. It crept into the Geneva Conventions uh, in the 1970s. Um, it is uh, starvation is also prohibited under crimes against humanity, though in a slightly different sense. It doesn't have to be in war, of course, to be a crime against humanity, but it does have to be widespread and systematic. Um, a, a starvation crime in war can be much smaller, more targeted. Uh, the Genocide Convention also prohibits starvation insofar as it is used as a means of, of destroying in whole or part populations, ethnic, racial, religious populations. And human rights law also has a right to food. This is the, the dominant um, contemporary international <coughs> definition. It's in the Rome Statute of the International <coughs> Criminal Court definition of crime. So this is, this is an international humanitarian law definition. Article 82B25, intentionally using starvation of civilians as a method of warfare by depriving them of objects indispensable to their survival, including willfully impeding relief supplies, as provided for in the Geneva Conventions. Let me unpack that a little bit. First of all, intention. The, the intention um, that is necessary to prove a, 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 a violation of international humanitarian law is simply the intention that the act, if perpetrated, would have had its normal consequences. So you do not need to intend that people suffer um, massive starvation in order to be responsible for uh, a crime under this definition. You can, your intention may be to get a, a town to surrender or a civilian population no longer to provide uh, material resources to a rebel group. But insofar as in besieging the town and burning their crops, it is perfectly foreseeable that the, the outcome will be starvation, you can be held responsible. Um, as a method of warfare, by depriving them of objects indispensable to their survival. Now the lawyers, the legal reading of that word by is for example. Okay. So depriving them of objects indispensable to their survival. Now food or food stores or, f or farms are one or you know, fishing boats, etc., are objects, are obviously objects indispensable to survival. But this also extends to things that are non-food items like water supplies, like shelter and blankets, like medical supplies, uh, like maternal care. So starvation in the legal sense goes beyond food. Okay, this is quite um, Im Im important for us to know. And the lawyers are very clear on this. And then including, well, this is sort of bracketed, although it has come out, uh, in, um, including willfully impeding relief supplies. That is sort of tacked on as, 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 as another example of the crime of starvation. Um, so this is um, quite an interesting um, sort of legal development. 
Um, there are some serious, there's a couple of problems with this, which I'm going to come to towards the end, some shortcomings on this. Um, but the, the key point I want to make is that the law is useful politically for drawing attention to this kind of, 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 of deprivation, this kind of prohibited evil act. It's useful to sharpen thinking. But it doesn't actually capture all the processes by any means whereby um, starvation is inflicted or, 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 or famine is caused. And one can um, um, think of a, a series of concentric circles. So in the middle, you get starvation crimes. You get these prohibited acts that very deliberately, under any of these um, traditions of law, cause starvation. And then you get what I would call faminogenic acts, acts that cause famine on a wider scale, which are not necessarily prohibited under the law or indeed put under any um, normal legal regimen, like economic policies. Insofar as a government pursues an economic policy uh, recklessly that um, foreseeably creates uh, calamitous uh, hunger, for example, you know, socialist governments pursuing collectivization, uh, governments at war pursuing uh, strategies for mobilizing resources for the war, which are, involve inflation and austerity, which means that some people starve. These are not the types of policies that normally fall under the rubric of, 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 of uh, law being criminalized. But nonetheless, they, they, are, uh, they are the sorts of acts for which political accountability ought to be sought. So those are acts of commission. And then you get faminogenic acts of omission. Even the poorest and least capable governments in the world today can prevent any, a natural calamity, a flood or a drought, for example, turning into a famine. And if they fail to do so, or increasingly if the international community fails to even give the most meager forms of relief, then there's an act, that is an act of omission that leads to, 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 to a famine. So let, let, let me pass this out a little bit more into the types of, of, of ways in which armed conflict, hunger, and starvation crimes um, in, interact um, to create these sorts of outcomes. You have the wider economic impacts of, of famine, the, just the general impoverishment, the um, diversion of resources, the, the austerity measures, the interruption to normal activities that, um, that, that, that can cause uh, hunger. You get the distribution of economic harms. And there's a very interesting case, let me spend a minute on it, which is the case of uh, the British policy in India, specifically in Bengal during World War II. In order to pay for the war, the, uh, the British government um, was advised by John Maynard Keynes that the, 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 the most basic way, the most accessible way was austerity and inflationary financing. But the British public at home would have been subject to sufficient deprivation that popular support for the war effort might have ebbed away. In India, they didn't much care. The India was a major contributor to British war effort, uh, including through industrial production, especially in the city of Calcutta. And in order for the resources necessary for um, war manufacturing and the supply of labor to the, uh, the war industries in Calcutta to be assured, a policy of inflationary financing and austerity was followed, which caused, among other things, um, uh, massive inflation in the price of basic foods, basic commodities. This was augmented by a few other things, like the, the, the um, impounding of the Bengal fishing fleet for few that fear that it would be used by Japanese for an invasion. Um, um, and and, and a, a sort of panic um, among um, a, a food wholesalers who are driving up their prices. But essentially it was a Keynesian type economic policy that drove up the price of, 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 of food in Bengal, um, causing uh, many millions of people to be unable to purchase basic commodities who then starved. So it was, it was a, a deliberate shifting of the burden of, of paying for the war onto people who are least able to, um, to, um, to meet that burden that, that, that caused that, that famine. And of course, there are people who benefit from famine. There are people who are able to buy up uh, land, land and other um, assets at cheap prices, you know, infamously so in Ireland, where 
uh, l better off landowners would give their tenants the price of a ticket on a boat to um, Boston or Quebec in return for them handing over their land and they were able to consolidate land in that way. Um, none of that can readily be criminalized. It's all unethical in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a deeply unpleasant way, but not necessarily criminal. Um, though in certain contexts, the, those types of economic policy decisions could be part could be brought in as evidence for a broader criminal conspiracy. I'll get onto that later. There's economic warfare, there's blockades and sanctions, such as, for example, the blockade on Yemen by the Saudi-led coalition, which has at times been very tight, at times been less tight. Um, now, what you tend to get when you get economic measures being used in war is you tend to get a war economy. Now, war economy occurs when people are profiteering um, from, uh, from the ongoing hostilities, from smuggling food across the front line, um, those sorts of things. So very often where you get a protracted siege, um, let's take the example of eastern Ghouta in, 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 in Syria recently, which was besieged for several years. The price of basic foods in eastern Ghouta rose to a point where at maximum they were between 40 and 60 times higher than those same foods one mile away in Damascus. So this was obviously an enormous commercial incentive for people to smuggle and to pay off the guards on both sides for the two sides to actually connive in maintaining that artificial scarcity for reasons of profit. Mm -hmm. And even though that connivance was not, the, that collusion was not the intention of the siege, soon it became uh, in, in, inextricably entangled with it. And maintaining the siege and those high prices obviously had uh, economic um, or financial benefits for, uh, for certain people. And repeatedly, we see these kinds of, 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 of war economies developing. Um, you know, corruption being entrenched in, 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 in the fabric of, of, um, of politics and, and, and society in a way that causes starvation and hardship. Um, obviously, these activities are criminal, though whether they are subject they should be subject to international humanitarian law is another question. And then you get starvation crimes as such, destruction of items indispensable to survival. Siege, scorched earth, attacks on food, water, shelter, medicine, etc. In the case of Yemen, you get all of these, for example, being done on a large scale. I added there obstruction or prevention of activities that could be obstruction of people migrating to get labor, or in the case of a country like South Sudan, obstruction of people going to find wild foods in the forests or, 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 go, or go and fish, um, which is it's, it's a blurry case in, un, 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 under the, the, the definition provided for um, um, uh, under Article 8 b of the Rome Statute. I think we would have to wait for a case to come before a judge and then see how the judge rules in that case to see if, if and quite logically, the definition would be expanded in, 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 in the judgment to include activities as well as objects. And then, of course, impeding relief supplies, which is um, generally happens alongside all these other things, though impeding relief supplies can rarely be said to be actually the cause of a famine. So with that as a sort of introduction to the whole schema of what are starvation crimes and where they fit in. I should say starvation crime is not a legal terminology. It's more a, a political terminology intended to bring together these, um, these strands of law and give them a sort of common impetus in, in, in public discourse to provide some momentum for drawing attention to these, um, um, to these crimes. So this map is the map of the Horn of Africa. It also has Yemen in there, because Yemen is next door. Um, and it's from FuseNet, the USAID-run famine early warning system. And what they do is they use different indicators for distress, malnutrition rates, uh, mortality rates, uh, food security indicators collected at a local level. And then they um, 
uh, collect these systematically, routinely, and they use a metric which is, de which is developed from a, a, a something called the IPC, the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification System, which has been developed over the last 20 years by uh, humanitarian practitioners, which has five levels from minimum, one, stressed, which is yellow, crisis, which is orange, emergency, which is dark red. There are a few emergency ones here. Probably can't see them very clearly because of the, the glare. And then famine, which is the top one, or the bottom one, number five, which uh, is, doesn't appear here. Though, where you see an exclamation point, that is a sort of fudge. And basically, the, 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 these data are calculated by a committee. They're worked out by a committee. There's an element of negotiation and interpretation required. And on that committee sits the government of whatever country. So if it is in the case of the government of South Sudan the go or the government of Yemen, they might be a feel a little embarrassment if, they, if large areas were to be declared as, as, as um, suffering from famine. They would feel themselves under pressure to submit to a lot more in being pushed around internationally. So what tends to happen is they resist, they give every possible reason why these data cannot be interpreted as reaching the famine threshold. And the, and the compromise is, we, is the international humanitarians will say, we'll call it emergency phase four, but we'll add that exclamation point, which means that if it were not for international assistance, it would be worse. So basically, anywhere where, where there's an exclamation point, it means there's a sensitivity and the, and, um, and, and, and the outcome of that negotiation between the, the UN and, 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 and and, and the government has resulted in that compromise being, uh, being made. Um, so it means cause for alarm is, is the reason. So let me describe briefly three of the, uh, the, the crises, the humanitarian famine crises that we face in these countries and, 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 and their interesting differences. What this type of map tends to do is evens out the complexities. What you, this is a map of outcome. But the actual processes whereby populations get to this state gets obscured. So let me start with Somalia over there on, on, on the right. In 2011, there was the first officially recognized famine of the 21st century in Somalia. It was the outcome of several different factors combining together, like a sort of the, the rogue wave of, 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 of faminogenesis. Um, one of them was a drought causing a production failure in many areas. Secondly, there was a spike in the global price of food for reasons entirely unrelated to Somalia, related to um, the, the knock-on effect of the global financial crisis and, and Wall Street uh, invest, uh, commodity brokers investing in, in particularly in biofuels and, and causing the price of food on world markets to go up. And because Somalia is very closely integrated into world food markets, very reliant on unimported food, if the price of food goes up by a factor of two, Somalis go hungry. Third was uh, a war uh, between the extremist group Al-Shabaab and a rather chaotic and corrupt government. Now, the actual fighting was not causing much in the way of hunger. Um, what, was, what was causing the, 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 the worsening of conditions was the, the taxation by al-Shabaab, which was, was extremely harsh, um, and the looting and corruption on the government side. Um, and the looting and corruption included uh, the, a, a cartel of traders associated with the World Food Program raking off a lot of money from that, and actually a lot of food from that. And then the final uh, factor was that the Somalia had sort of managed to cope with these multiple stresses over the years. But the final factor that, 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 that contributed to the famine was the US government decided on a strict enforcement of the provisions of the Patriot Act, which prohibits uh, any material assistance to a group designated as a terrorist, and Al-Shabaab was designated as terrorist. And if you are running an, an NGO or, or a, a UN agency or you're a US government um, contractor working in Somalia and you're providing food or medicine in Somalia, you would be open to prosecution 
um, under the Patriot Act, if any of your assistants, even inadvertently, even in very small quantities, even if one bag of food were to fall into the hands of al-Shabaab. And that sent a chill throughout the humanitarian community. And for eight months, as the famine developed, um, the, uh, the US uh, um, uh, Department of Commerce, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, its lawyers insisted, no, there is no compromise on this. USAID and State Department taking the other side. And it was only when famine was declared in July of 2011 that, that a humanitarian workaround was found so that humanitarian workers in that situation would not be exposed to the threat of prosecution if in good faith they uh, provided assistance and some of it inadvertently hell, fell into the hands of, of, of al-Shabaab. The famine cost 250,000 lives. Um, the great majority of those would not have been lost if the response had gone ahead um, as the UN and others had wanted eight months previous. Uh, it's unfortunate there's been no apology from the um, Obama administration for this. One of the, con the more positive consequences is that faced with a broadly comparable set of circumstances last year, um, the UN and USAID were adopted what they called no regrets programming. They were much more proactive and, and much more accommodating and, 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 and generous in their assistance, and Somalia did not go over the edge in, in, in the last year. Um, moving on to, to, to South Sudan. Um, the civil war broke out in South Sudan in, in 2013, and South Sudan had, prior to that, been a really very food secure country. There'd been almost no, um, dur during the previous few years, there'd been almost no serious humanitarian crises. But the way in which that war was fought, um, unfortunately, in included the use of starvation as a tactic throughout. I'll give two cases. One was a, a, a case in, 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 in 2016 into 2017 in the town of Wau, where there'd been a long-standing dispute among the, between two ethnic political groups, one the Dinka associated with the government, the other the Fertit associated with the opposition. The government Dinka unsurprisingly got the upper hand. They drove 40,000 people approximately into a thickly forested area outside the city where there were no food resources, maintained a tight siege on them, prevented for some six or seven months, pre prevented any access getting in. The number affected was not sufficiently large for it to qualify as, as IPC level five famine. There are various technical uh, thresholds that need to, be, need to be crossed. But for this particular group, there's no doubt that you could see a very deliberate, sustained attempt to use starvation as a way of destroying the capacity of this group to resist, as a way of punishing them. Genocidal? Probably not, but certainly uh, a, 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 a war crime. Another case is in the center of the country, in the uh, area where there's, there are oil fields, a place called, rather ironically, Unity State. There was a, a, a series of military campaigns in which the, the, um, the forces aligned with the government, um, paramilitary forces drawn from mostly from the local communities, mounted uh, military campaigns of such thorough and systematic dispossession of the targeted communities that they were reduced to, 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 to starvation very, very quickly. One of the, the, the particularly sad ironies of this is that these, these communities in, in, in this area and adjacent areas have over the last 30 years repeatedly been subject to this kind of raiding causing massive hunger. What made this particularly worse was that it was their own neighbors that were doing it, the very close co-ethnies. -ethn these were newer <laughs> communities, associate, ethnic newer associated with the government, raiding of ethnic Nua associated with the opposition. And one of the deeply discomforting things about that type of, 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 of intimate raiding is that your neighbors know exactly where your food stores are, exactly where you go to, 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 to keep your cattle hidden, exactly where um, your reserves of wild food are, uh, in a way that raiders from the Arab North, for example, 
would not know. So they would just go and burn and, 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 and steal what they can get their hands on and then go. But the immediate neighbors will be far more devastating. And that caused a famine. And these are both cases, I think, where the, that narrower conception of famine crimes, of clear lines of culpability uh, through middle levels of the military command can very, very clearly be, be, be attributed. Let me briefly describe northern Sudan, which is as yet not really on the radar. What, what, where you see those, those sort of orange crisis areas, those are very thinly populated areas um, in, in remote rural areas, which are where in some cases there's been um, ongoing uh, low-level civil war for many years. In other cases, um, um, drought affected. The concern in northern Sudan is something different, and and this is and it is um, it has echoes from the disc from the story I told about Bengal earlier on, and the story is this, which is that um, Sudan, as I'm sure you all know, in 2011 split into two, and South Sudan went its separate way, became independent, and when it became independent, it took with it three quarters of the oil of the United Sudan and 90% of the foreign exchange. So this caused a massive macroeconomic crisis for northern Sudan. And there were various mechanisms proposed for blunting that, you know, th that huge macroeconomic insult. None of them were implemented. Basically, the, the Sudan government, corrupt, kleptocratic, still bellicose, authoritarian, just had to stumble along and um, suffering the consequences. And, and I think many in the international community with a sense of schadenfreude said, well, they brought it on themselves, let them suffer. One of the things that happened, though, which for the Sudanese regime, for the president of Omar al-Bashir, seemed to be a godsend, but was a godsend with a poisonous sting, was that the next year, 2012, large artisanal gold deposits were discovered in Darfur, in, in the far west. And, and this was a, a gold is obviously a way of getting foreign currency. Now, the difference between oil and gold, however, is that if, you, if, if you're extracting oil, you need all this infrastructure, you need these pipelines, et cetera, et cetera. And it is not difficult for the government to get money out of, out, out of oil. Artisanal gold fields, especially if they're in a remote and lawless area, are a different matter. Anyone can take a little nugget of gold you know, put it in his pocket, go across the border to, to Libya or Chad and cha exchange it, you know, not even for money, but maybe for a, a, a Toyota Land Cruiser with a submachine gun, which he can then drive back and start holding up, you know, police stations and lorries and things like that. And a lot of that was beginning to happen. So in order for the, the, the government to get the gold, which it desperately needed for its foreign exchange, it did two things. One is it empowered a paramilitary group to control that area. The leader of that paramilitary group, a man called Mohammed Hemeti Hamdan, is now the de facto ruler of Sudan. He was the guy who really took over from Bashir in April. And it was because of the, his control over the gold and the smuggling, and also he rents his troops out as mercenaries in Yemen, that he managed to secure that power to basically be the heir apparent. Um, but the other thing that they did, linked to this, is, is they um, they paid over the market price for that gold in Sudanese currency, which meant the central bank of Sudan began printing money in large amounts, and the central bank actually became the, the buyer. And this was very destabilizing to the macro economy. And the, one of the consequences of that was that anyone who was on a wage or anyone who was part of that sort of urban wage economy or indeed the, the wage economy of the mechanized farms, etc. The purchasing power of their wages, their income shrank. And that, of course, is the, that is the reason why they turned out on the streets last year, saying, down with the rule of thieves, we cannot buy bread, we cannot get fuel for our tractors, etc. And so those street protests, the economic conditions that drove them were exactly the product of the economic strategy of the government, of Omar al-Bashir and his, and his friend Hermeti, for getting enough money to hang on to power. Essentially, what Bashir and Hermeti were doing was robbing the, 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 the working people 
and the middle classes of, of urban and central Sudan in order to reward these paramilitaries who are now have the reputation of being these lawless brigands from the peripheries who have gold in their pockets. Now, the problem that now faces the incoming uh, prime minister, uh, civilian prime minister, Abdullah Hamdok, who, who, who came into, uh, was appointed um, in, in August as a consequence of the, this popular uprising and the overthrow of Bashir, is the, 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 the big challenge that he faces is how do I get control of this back? Because if I don't, then that dispossession, that deprivation of those way net journeying people is going to plunge the country as a whole into famine. Sadly, the, uh, the US has given him no slack. There's been no debt relief, no lifting of sanctions or whatever. So the, 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 poor, the poor fellow is facing a very, very difficult task. Um, and so that type of humanitarian crisis or famine would not figure on this. It is not that classical type of, 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 of rural production collapse famine. Let me move on very quickly, because I really had not intended to go on longer than this. But I'll just say a couple of things that are happening. One is last year, there was a Security Council resolution, 2417, on armed conflict and hunger, which arose because there were four so-called famines, or near famines at the time, Northeast Nigeria, Yemen, South Sudan, and Somalia. Famine was making a comeback. The Netherlands sponsored this resolution, which points to the fact that there needs to be um, action on, on, on this, uh, this phenomenon, including identifying uh, the reality that um, starvation is prohibited under international law. What has happened is that the, the follow-up to 2417 is largely entrusted to the World Food Programme. It does a decent job of analysis, and this is a quote from the, the follow-up report uh, from the David Beasley, the executive director, and I'll just read it. The report shows again the tragic link between conflict and hunger and how it still pervades far too much of the world. We need better and quicker access in all conflict zones so we can get to more of the civilians who need our help. So he immediately moves to the access. He jumps over all that type of analysis that I've just done in the last 25 minutes just to humanitarian access. And then he says, but what the world needs most of all is an end to wars. Well, yes, of course. Um, and then if you read what is in that document, the headings are all to do really with the operational activities of the UN. And these are all laudable, but they are not dealing with the problem. Attacks on aid workers, humanitarian ceasefires is what they're really concerned with. Hard to reach areas, a euphemism for places where people actively blocking them, protecting medical facilities. Uh, in, um, uh, something I glossed over, cases where you have long-term conflicts and then a natural disaster occurs in the middle of that long-term conflict, etc. Um, another thing that's going on is that definition under, of, of starvation as a prohibited act under uh, the Rome Statute applies only in international armed conflicts which is rather odd. It's really an oversight. It's simply completely absent from the listing of crime, crimes in non-international armed conflicts. And I think the reason for this is no one was really paying much attention. It just wasn't a priority when the Rome Statute was being drafted. And it shows how this wasn't you know, on anybody's agenda. Um, and the, uh, but it's an obvious gap. And the Swiss government is proposing an amendment to the Rome Statute um, which will be debated uh, in December at the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome uh, Statute in The Hague. And we will, Peace Foundation work with this group, Global Rights Compliance, that is actually um, pushing this. It's not going to make much of a difference, but it is a way of a, a sort of symbolic act. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to say is that the African Union and African institutions have been really absent and silent from this debate, which I think is very unfortunate. It reflects, I think, the very weak leadership that the African Union's had over the last few years. Um, but there's one particularly interesting opportunity here, which is the Constitutive Act of the African Union, when it was adopted in 2002, has this remarkably strong provision for the authorizing intervention 
in cases of war crimes and crimes against humanity, which of course include starvation crimes, although they didn't think of it at the time. Um, it's unlikely they would actually organize an intervention, but at least they can you know, rattle the saber and say, you need to do something about it to a government like the government of South Sudan. And then in places like Somalia, they have, they have their own mission there, which ought to be paying attention to this. And it ought to be on the agenda of, 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 of African mediators. But um, I've really used up my time and more, so let me let me stop there, and we can we can have a, some few minutes for discussion. How about now? Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that rich presentation. Um, we now have about 15 minutes for q and I know some students are going to have to leave to go to class at 1, but if you're able to stay, we're going to have an open discussion here. And so I open the floor to you guys, and I will come around. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a question about um, the so the terminology, the various terms that were used: programming, humanitarian assistance, aid. I'm, I'm wondering, is there a, a, a kind of practical distinction to draw among these terms? Or I'm also wondering, um, in, like, are these all um, given with any with, like with no strings attached, or what's the expectation in that regard? Um, or are they all kind of synonymous? No, it's not. I did a little bit. Uh, shall I answer that one, or do you want to take a couple more? Why don't we start with this? Okay. The, um, they, um, they're overlapping terms, and the, um, the, the programming, the use of humanitarian assistance technologies and tools has, particularly over the last 25 years, become a lot more complex. Uh, but the fundamentals have not changed. The fundamentals are all about getting access for uh, basic humanitarian commodities to, to these affected areas. That said, I mean, there, are two, there, are two, um, there are two areas of innovation that I think are really quite interesting. One is the increasing use of cash because just providing cash uh, is, is cheaper, m more efficient, can reach more people than, than say, providing um, food and where markets function, which is pretty much everywhere. I wouldn't advise putting cash, too much cash into South Sudan because the, some of the areas where, that are most in most need, it's not going to do a lot, but in Somalia and northern Sudan, absolutely. Um, the other element, which, which actually came out in an interesting way in the Yemen case, um, there was, as you may know, there was a um, the uh, a key element in the in, in the Yemen war and the Yemen crisis was a city. It was a port city called Hodeida, which is um, about here. It's on, it's on the Red Sea, and it's where most of most of the food imports to Yemen, both commercial and humanitarian, come through for the majority of the Yemeni population. And uh, 11 months ago, the Saudis and the Emiratis, who are fighting the, the Houthis, who control most of Yemen, announced they were going to attack it. And that would have led to a major disruption in the food supply chain. Um, and there was a UN-led mediation to try and, and pull them back from the brink, which succeeded probably more because they couldn't fa the Saudis and Emiratis couldn't face the likely casualties of the attack than the UN mediation. But the, the most interesting outcome of the mediation was something entirely unrelated to Hodeida, which was that the central bank of Yemen would pay the salaries of workers in Yemen who had been on the public payroll, who hadn't been paid for four years. And that act did far more to relieve the famine than allowing through relatively modest amounts of humanitarian assistance. 
Well, I have one question as people think of some others. Um, as you described over the course of the talk, there's obviously very little accountability, whether it's coming from international organizations, whether it's coming from governments, or even from the African Union. So in your view, what are some of the next steps, or what are some of the concrete mechanisms to hold the, the participants, the creators of starvation crimes accountable in more meaningful ways? I was hoping someone would ask that question. I mean, it would be great to see some of these villains you know, put up before the International Criminal Court or some other hybrid court, or indeed some states have universal jurisdiction, so France or Belgium or, 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 or um, Germany. So for example, in the case of Yemen, there is a strong case that, say, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia is, has ultimate criminal responsibility is leading a, a criminal conspiracy to starve Yemen. And um, he would argue, oh, that wasn't our intention. We, our intention in launching this war was to defeat the Houthis. Well, if you'd done it in six, to which the answer would be, if you'd done it in six weeks, maybe, yes, no one would have starved in six weeks. But when it became adamantly clear, when so many reports came out that this is what, you would be, what was happening, then you became liable in the way that a product manufacturer becomes liable when information about the defects of that product become clear and they don't do a product recall, et cetera. Um, so you know, some of these people, should they you know, travel to you know, France or Germany, could be liable to being uh, having a sealed arrest warrant unsealed. And that would be very interesting. Um, I, I think it would be... Um, Having said that, the much more likely route would be something like the hybrid court for South Sudan if it gets set up. Um, most likely it would bring um, medium level perpetrators to account. It would be very unlikely that it would bring the high level perpetrators um, to account. And in cases such as the one I was describing for Sudan where a humanitarian crisis is being gen or has been generated through the manipulation of, of financial and monetary mechanisms. Um, I don't see how it, how it could happen unless it were to be combined with, with something else. The point really being that the way, the way ahead is to use the law as the rallying point for public campaigns to say this is intolerable, this is toxic, we shouldn't allow this to happen. And interestingly, to my surprise, over the last couple of years since my book was published, I found a very strong consensus across the political spectrum that starvation crimes ought to be not allowed. So when she was um, permanent representative at the Security Council for the United States, Nikki Haley, you know, she spoke up very clearly in very you know, precise language, actually, condemning the Syrian government for starvation crimes. She didn't condemn her... Saudi and Emirati allies for Yemen, but nonetheless, she, you know, she, she came out on a limb on, 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 on Syria. And she said some fairly strong things, and others have done the same about South Sudan as well. So the, this is an issue that is um, generating, um, I think, a level of, 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 of public support that's quite encouraging. There is, okay. Hi, thank you for that very interesting talk. Um, I had a question about the, the distinction between omission and commission, um, and to the extent that it revolves around the idea of intentionality, because I'm wondering, you'd given the example of uh, Syria, um, and I was wondering if it's possible to think of famineogenic as also acts of commission? Um, because there were reports, for instance, I don't know about Eastern Ghouta, but there were reports about Madaya, for instance, where um, the idea of aid convoys being blocked was not uh, and, and guards accepting bribes was not seen as only petty, like petty uh, corruption, but going all the way back to the state. And many aid convoys were being deliberately squeezed mm -hmm. uh, by the Assad government directly. And so that seems to be a fairly engineered uh, tactic to say, first we, we bomb a town or we destroy a town, then we blackmail the international community in order to allow access to that town for humanitarian convoys. So. I'm wondering whether those, I, I understand that there's no direct causation there, and so perhaps mm. it's famineogenic rather than an act mm. of uh, commission, but could we also see those as, as equally intended? I, 
I, I believe so, and in fact, uh, I didn't go into more detail on this, but the one area in, 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 in which the law and practice has been much better elaborated is humanitarian access. So, um, so, so acts that impede humanitarian ac access or increasingly there's even a debate about in withholding information that would, uh, that, that would, in the normal course of events, spark humanitarian action. So that um, I if you simply don't allow people in to, to make a humanitarian assessment, knowing that if they followed the usual protocols for that humanitarian assessment, it would come out as you know, level four or even level five, and therefore there would be an impulse to provide assistance. You know, these types of activities are, 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 are becoming codified as, as the types of activities which, we, um, which would count as, as, as starvation crimes. Um, what I had in mind in that concentric circles was more something like, you know, there's a, 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 um, a drought affecting a certain part of the country and, and, and the government is just rather you know, inept or, or laggard in responding. Um, um, but those, those more precise, precise things, I think, absolutely. Let me add, okay, there's one question over here. <laughs> I was wondering if you could touch upon the perspectives of the people in these different areas, uh, particularly like crisis, emergency, and the places where there's famine but it's not called famine, in terms of like how do they view it and who do they blame? Because outsiders, I think, take a different perspective, and I would just like to hear about the perspectives of okay. those experiencing it. I think one of the, this is actually touches on a very deep point which is, and let me take the case of Ireland. Um, it's very striking, you know, there was the Great Famine in Ireland, or as some like to call it, the Great English Famine in Ireland, that occurred in the 1840s. And it took until the 1990s for this to be really talked about officially in Ireland. And it took several generations because those who went through that famine did not want to talk about it. And if you read some of the historians, the most sympathetic historians, talking about, describing in detail what happened, the experience of, of hunger and famine is something that is very personally and profoundly not only distressing but degrading. Because through those years, months or years, you as, let's say, the head of a family or as a mother, you feed some people, you do not feed others. You turn your neighbors or your cousins away at the door. You know, in extremists, you have only enough food to feed one child and not another, or to pay for medicine for one child or not another. And then people who are slightly higher up in the social hierarchy and these little gradations of, of economic and social status, which may not mean much in normal times, mean an awful lot at times of real deprivation becoming hugely important and slightly richer neighbors you know will benefit you know they will seize land you know they will take their neighbors daughters for the night you know all these things are what are uppermost in people's memories and so when they emerge from the situation what they remember is the degradation the humiliation the shame the sense of failure that I failed, I had to bury my children. I failed because I could not, you know, I was the priest of a parish and I couldn't save my parish, et cetera, et cetera. And one of, for me, the, actually the thing that I find most personally rewarding about this project is going and speaking to people who are activists or community leaders in these places and saying, you know, we see this as a crime inflicted upon you you know, you shouldn't be ashamed. You know, it's like the Me Too movement, you know? It wasn't your fault. You shouldn't internalize it. It was somebody else who did this to you. And you, and, and you should be able to, you know, bury your children in, 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 in dignity. You should be able to say, this wasn't my fault. And I think that's the, in, more profound than any of the calling to account is actually that, that sort of emancipation from, um, from shame. <laughs> 
Well, I think that's an excellent point to end on because it helps to sort of reprioritize this perspective onto those who are suffering from the famine. And I'd like to thank Professor DeWall for coming. Thank you all for attending the talk and join me in thank you.